Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending our webinar this evening from the town hall series, Critical Conversations in World Language Education. I'm Victoria Russell and I'm the 2022 actual president. I'm also a professor of Spanish and foreign language education at Valdosta State University in Georgia. Before we get started tonight, I have some people I wanna thank. Um, I want to thank, first of all, Dr. Krishana Heinz Gaither and Adrian Brandenburg. These are actual board members and they are co-chairs of our new Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. And they um, organized this, they selected the topic and the panelists, so thank you very much. I want to thank Joe Valina, who is the Director of Marketing for Actful, and his entire team for doing a wonderful job helping us with this webinar, as well as Dr. Celia Chomon Zamora, who is the Actful Director of Professional Learning and Certification. Finally, I want to thank our wonderful Executive Director, Howie Berman, and all of the Actful staff. So taking a look, what is this series, Critical Conversations in World Language? Looking at the next slide, um, we are holding a webinar from each of the pillars in Actful Strategic Plan. You see, we have five pillars here, advocacy and outreach, diversity, equity, and inclusion, professional learning, research, and teacher recruitment and retention. And we are selecting a key topic from each of these pillars to include in this series. So looking at the next slide, I want to encourage all of you to enroll. These webinars are open to both members and non-members and they are completely free of charge. You can register on the Actful website. <clears throat> the next one will take place on June 8th at 8 p.m. Eastern. And that is from the research pillar. It's entitled Research-Based Strategies for Supporting Heritage Learners in Mixed Classrooms. So tonight, we have a very special topic looking at our next slide. Anti-racism in languages navigating the current climate. Just going to give you an overview of how the webinar is going to be laid out this evening. Each of our panelists is going to speak for four minutes on selected talking points, and that part of the discussion will be moderated by Adrian Brandenburg. And then we're going to have a discussion with some questions that were pre selected. <clears throat> All the while, whenever you have a question, please put your question into the chat. When we reach the slide that has a big question mark on it, your questions will then be read to the panelists. So please make sure you're asking questions as they come up and putting those right into the chat. At the end of the webinar, to me, this is a very exciting part. You're going to learn how you can engage with the topic once the webinar is over. So we know that we can't learn everything in one hour. We need to keep working, keep reflecting. The recording and reflection questions that were written by the panelists will be available and you'll have an opportunity to create products and resources for other educators that will be published by Actful and credited to you. So make sure you stay till the end to find out about how to do that. Now, without further ado, let's go ahead and look at the next slide with the names of our outstanding panelists. I'm just gonna read you a very short bio on each one. We have Dr. Cecile Axilien. She is a professor and chair of interdisciplinary studies at Kennesaw State University in Kennesaw, Georgia. She is the author of several books and articles that focus on Caribbean and African cultures. She has written for Truthout and Latin American Commentator. She is the chair of the editorial board for the journal Women, Gender, and Families of Color. She is also the vice president of the Haitian Studies Association. <laughs> Dr. Krishana Heinz Gaither was a Spanish professor for almost 17 years. She is the past president of the Foreign Language Association of North Carolina. She is past chair of Actful's Educators of African American Students Special Interest Group. She is also a current Actful board member. Krishana serves as the vice president for equity, diversity, and justice at Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles, California. Miriam Sharif is from Denver, Colorado, and the daughter of Dominican and Sierra Leonean immigrants. She is a junior at Guilford College, majoring in community justice studies with a double minor in Spanish language and peace and conflict studies. Miriam identifies as Afro-Latina and has dedicated herself to fight for others and use her voice for those who have been denied the opportunity. 
Miriam is involved in community activism and organizing and has served as community liaison for the youth organization called 10 for 10. She hopes to further her education in public policy to continue fighting for her community and dismantle the systems that oppress Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Francoise Tenou is, anti -bias, is an anti-bias language educator, currently looking for her next community and workspace. She is a proud Chilean immigrant and her trajectory as an educator includes teaching dual language, ESL and Spanish programs. She is a Spanish native speaker, fully bilingual in English, who loves learning languages. She has conversational skills in Portuguese and basic understanding of Italian. She's just started to learn Korean because of her interest in Korean dramas and K-pop. Now I'm going to call on Adrian Brandenburg to come on and uh, begin the discussion moderation. Thanks, Victoria. Um, uh, Joe, if you could go back to the very first bio slide, that would be great. Um, and I just want to mention that I dropped their full uh, a link to their full bios in the chat if you would like to take a look at their complete bios. Those are just the short ones. Um, what we're going to do now is give each panelist a chance to kind of speak to their expertise. So we're going to start with um, Dr. Cecile Axilien. She's going to be talking about kind of the lay of the land, the situation. What is the current climate in Georgia? Um, as soon as she's done, she'll pass it to Dr. Krishana heinz gaither who's going to be talking about situations, um, anti-racism teaching in the, um, in the secondary classroom, and also talk about some teaching strategies. After that, we'll hear from Miriam Sharif um, sharing her um, point of view as a student. She is our student voice tonight and um, how she was reflected, um, how her experience was or was not reflected in the classroom. And then after Miriam, we will finish with Francois Tenu, who is going to be speaking about what this work looks like in um, elementary classrooms and also classrooms of novice learners. So um, we're gonna start with Dr. Cecile Xavier. Um, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, or uh, good afternoon, where if you are in the West Coast. Uh, I am trying to get everything in four minutes. It's really hard. But I do want to start out by saying I am speaking as an individual, as Cecile Axilien, and not on behalf of Kennesaw State University. This is important, given my positionality as a black woman in Georgia and the current attack on critical race theory. I will just uh, mention two things I wanna focus on. Uh, in Georgia, there is the House Bill 1084 that was passed and it was, it's a measure basically that's banning the quote unquote divisive concepts from being taught in school. And the House Subcommittee on Academic Innovation approved that bill because it claims that mm -hmm. it empowers parents to ensure that kids and children in our school are not pitted against each other. And that's a direct quote. So this is very problematic. As we talk about language, we talk about mm -hmm. culture, we talked about um, what it means to see the other person. We, we have to, if we really teaching from the perspective of anti-bias, anti-racist, we have to talk about issues of power, privilege, positionality. As someone trained in French and Francophone studies, I cannot talk about French. I cannot teach the French language without talking about the fact that there are more people who look like me who speak French as a result of colonization. And such a bill will in many ways prevent teachers from, from um, talking about that. Another thing I will briefly mention is that in, in March, the AAUP censures the university system of Georgia because of the way the system has decided to remove protections of tenure and academic freedom from the system's post-tenure um, review policies. What happened is in October, the USG Board of Regents, they basically adopted changes to the system that make it possible to get rid of tenure faculty without them having a type of dismissal hearing. 
And this is very important because as we know, tenure protect academic freedom. And this is so flagrant that as recently as um, this past semester, there was a department who was doing a national search to hire a chair and they had a total of four people, four candidates, including one who is currently at my university. So there is real impact to that. There is real impact. There is real attack to what does that mean when we want students both at K-12 and at the university to be global citizen, if we are not teaching them about other people's culture, if we cannot talk about these issues of um, power, privilege, positionality, if we cannot talk about history, this is what this is doing. I think my time is up. Thank you very much. I will pass the baton to my colleague um, and friend and comrade and accomplice, Dr. Kushana heinz -Gader. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecile. I appreciate the framework that you have laid for us. Let me share my, let's see, share my screen. Oh, I think I need sharing privileges. These are my beautiful students. I take them everywhere that I go. So you can have kind of images to put with what I'll share with you. So I'll be focusing on the classroom today. And a few points that I want to leave you with. First of all, adopt a framework. Sometimes we become very passionate about anti-racism and we may not have thought through exactly the process or framework. But if we're called on this and someone wants to know what are we doing in the classroom, I always say have a way of responding to that. So have an anti-racist framework. Um, I love the framework of um, Dana Simmons um, and she has a five point um, framework for being an anti-racist educator, which you could easily look up. But vigilant self-awareness, teaching true history, acknowledging racism and white supremacy, talking about race openly with students, and when you see racism, do something. This may not be the framework for you, but do have a framework for your work. Um, adopt a model. I really love this model from um, Michigan State University, where they say if you're incorporating anti-racism, for example, start with building relationships, then discussing social identity, then discussing the hot topics, and then some type of action planning or community building. So I really like this particular framework. Um, this is just an example of something that can be done, the culture box, where students place items that are representative of their cultures in a box, and then they discuss that in class. This can be done at all levels and in the target language. I have three languages on your screen, just so you can kind of have an idea of what that might look like. Uh, build anti-racist vocabulary. And so oftentimes we lack practice in talking about anti-racism. So for example, tell me about X. Have you ever considered a different perspective? I don't see it the way that you do. I see it as blank. We don't agree on this, but we can agree on that. The last one, please do not say blank in my presence. And so different levels of communication, but oftentimes our students do not have that skill set. Um, and so it needs to be shared with them. Um, skip this one. Also make sure that you balance your content. So here, my husband and I were actually presenting to a first grade classroom um, on anti-racism and we were using Kenya, Africa. And so we talked about the Maasai tribe in Africa, in Kenya, but we wanted to make sure that we balance that because everyday Kenyans for the most part are not wearing Maasai attire. And so we made sure that they also had images that were representative of school children who are wearing uniforms. There's no hierarchy of these two groups, but making sure that we're balanced in our content. Uh, put it out there. So a question that students may ask you, I do not understand why we have to talk about race. Uh, why can't we all just be humans? And so I like to put that question out there and then ask the students, how would you respond to this? If someone were to ask you, why are we even talking about race? How might your students respond? Have them to role play that and give possible responses and let that spark the conversation. So don't shy away from things like this. You know that people are thinking it. So go ahead and put it out there. Um, an activity that I love that it's done by um, Michelle Nicola, a professor, she does a gallery walk and has her students to um, 
give a list of actors, celebrities, sports, people, and then she asks what's missing. So she'll have them then walk around the room and determine what's missing from what, uh, what they have shared. And so if they didn't mention that there are people of color in Port uh, Portuguese speaking areas, she's gonna mention that. If they overrepresented people of color in sports and not in other areas, she'll mention that. So I, I love this activity that she does. All right. And then um, I, let's see, skipping around here. Okay, counter stories are really important that we're also presenting our students with, there are gonna be master narratives that are out there that are at play. And so making sure that we're also countering the stories that are out there that are detrimental and even harmful to certain groups. And this is just one example of beauty um, in the black community. All right, I'll stop there. I'm sorry, we're gonna turn it over to Miriam, our student presenter. Thank you. Um, so I believe we'll be talking about my experiences. Um, and so something that I would like to be addressed in the world of language um, and in the classroom is that um, there needs to be some, um, some sort of representation. Um, and as an Afro-Latina, um, I did not have that representation at all growing up, um, not in media and definitely not in books and especially not in the classrooms. Um, we would never really learn about Dominican Republic at all. Um, and then when I took Spanish classes, um, Dominican Republic was like at the very, very bottom and I would be the only black um, Latina in the classroom. Um, so having to explain to other Hispanic um, speakers and other um, language speakers about my identity um, and having to explain to people why my accent is different and um, why my skin color is a certain way um, was always so belittling to me. So um, I think that representation is always something that definitely needs to be at the forefront of your classroom, making sure that if you're having a lesson about um, Latin America or the Caribbean, making sure that you're including um, a lot of the countries or islands that aren't um, always talked about or represented, and also making sure that you're addressing that a certain um, Latina doesn't have to look a certain way. Um, and then uh, another point is definitely talking about the diaspora, talking about the diversity within um, whatever cultural group that you're talking about, because oftentimes that diaspora will be um, very intersectional with uh, whatever it is that you're talking about. So. Um, I've had to have a conversation about how Black Lives Matter also fits into colorism, which also fits into the um, Hispanic Latino community um, because there's a lot of colorism there. Um, and so having to always have to be the one to educate others can be really, really draining. So making sure that um, you have that training, that you have that mindset um, is always gonna make your students feel a lot more heard and a lot more represented. Um, and uh, my final point is um, obviously being open-minded um, and you know, making sure that you're really taking the time to learn about um, what it is that you're teaching in your classroom. Um, just because like I said, like having to always have to repeat myself or having to always um, explain myself to people can be you know, really tiring. So um, sometimes we need to have, sometimes we advocate for ourselves, but having someone else who can advocate for you um, makes your uh, teaching so much more worthy and your students will definitely um, thank you for that. So um, really short, but uh, pretty much my experiences um, summed up. Um, so thank you. Hi, um, can I share a slide too? Do I have the privilege? <laughs> Just one second, please. Okay, so first of all, most of us who teach elementary and, and middle school uh, um, get underestimated and our students too about the ability for them to learn and understand um, issues uh, as racism, you know? Uh, and I'm here to tell you that that's not true. 
Uh, so the first thing that I want to point out is that all the current climate that we're going, we're talking about is the result of colonialism. So our main goal as educators should be uh, not concentrated on just the events that are happening now, but also um, making sure, especially if we're going to prepare classes for uh, younger students that making sure that we have enough knowledge in order to simplify lessons to make it available for younger learners. So that means working and deconstructing our own biases, um, unpacking our own privilege and seeing ourselves and our students as people with identities that are intersectional, that we have system of oppressions working against us, but also we have privileges. And our students too have system of oppressions working against them and privilege. That's the first thing that I can tell you as an elementary teacher that is key to preparing good lessons that are a bar, anti-bias and anti-racist. The second thing that I would say is that we should always aim for integration. And that's why I put the, Bennett developmental, uh, developmental model here, because um, for example, a teacher that wants to prepare a lesson for younger learners, if for example, that teacher is stuck in the denial and defense um, stage, that teacher won't be able to prepare a good lesson for younger learners because they themselves don't have the right lens to prepare that lesson. So that's why I said, the first priority for us as educators, no matter what level we teach, should be working on ourselves um, and making sure that we understand the historical roots and how the language we're teaching uh, were, uh, were born. For example, I teach Spanish, I'm a Spanish speaker. I need to be aware that it's the, langu the language of the colonizers, that my ancestors that were indigenous were colonized and forced to obliterate their own language in order to learn Espanol. That's the first thing, for example, that I, that I, I would advise teachers uh, that teach younger students to, to be aware of. What is it, what is it that we, um, that we carry when we bring that language into the classroom. The second thing that I wanna point out is that teaching languages and teaching culture is not anti-racism. It doesn't automatically translate to that. It's not anti-bias either. So we can prepare a excellent lesson about language and culture as tourism culture, and it won't make our students reflect on the system of oppressions currently at work. And remember, the main goal is dismantling systems. So how does it look like in elementary school? First, when the teacher has traveled this road up to the end and they are ready to integrate the knowledge they have acquired and the unpacking they have done with their own privilege. It looks like, how does it look like in lower school? In lower school, in elementary school or for younger learners, it looks like representation. It looks like identity work. It looks like um, mirror windows and sliding doors. Uh, it, it looks like conversations about stories that are related to people. For example, in younger grades, I teach a unit about Celia Cruz. What do we learn about Celia Cruz? We learn all the wonderful things that she did because um, positive narratives are key in the construction of anti-bias, but we also learn what part of her identity made her vulnerable to discrimination. And this is how students that are younger learn these without really uh, speaking about, uh, you know, um, without really speaking about racism per se, they by themselves discover which were the systems of oppression by the storytelling of this person. Um, in fourth grade, I taught about Jean-Michel Basquiat for a reason, because I wanted my students to see the diaspora in him, to see the multiple identities, the multiple uh, identity markers that were part of his persona. Um, and that's one of the many examples that I, that I could give. My time is up, but I think the first point that I made is the most important. We need to work on ourselves in order to prepare those lessons. Thank you.
Thank you so much, all of our wonderful panelists for those wonderful talking points. Um, next, we have some questions. So if we advance to the next slide, um, we're, I'm going to throw a question out to one of the panelists, and then I want all the other panelists to chime in as they see fit. And then when we're done with this question, we'll move on to the next one. So the first question, how do we incorporate current events into the classroom? And how do we make the choice of what to include and what not to include? For example, the war in Ukraine, the deaths of George Floyd and Brianna Taylor, et cetera. What would you like to be addressed in the world language classroom and why? So I'm gonna throw this out first to our student voice, Miriam, and then the others, please chime in as you see fit. Thank you for the question. Um, I think this is really, really important. I think that um, uh, you should always try to incorporate um, events that are happening in the classroom. Um, I had the opportunity um, to assist South High School in Denver, Colorado, and um, it was a really diverse uh, school, so to speak. Um, and really the only times that we got to speak about social issues was in AVID. Um, and even when we would speak about the social issues, it would kind of just be like someone in the classroom was holding back or a teacher was holding back. And I think that that was just because they were um, like afraid to really speak on what's happening. Um, and I can say that um, like when you're not actively speaking out of, about um, things that are happening like uh, Breonna Taylor or um, Elijah McLean or Black Lives Matter or immigration or what have you, um, I feel like a lot of the students that are in your class are definitely not gonna feel heard. Um, and so I think that when you are incorporating these things, I think that you need to do a lot of your research. You need to make sure that you're getting your information from um, places that are, are um, very accurate. Um, I think that uh, when you're spelling out people's names, you need to make sure that spelling is correct. I think that um, information is just always like it always needs to be accurate and you always need to make sure that you're sharing it um, in a appropriate matter. Um, and I think uh, making sure that you're not, like I said, holding back on on what it is that you need to need to um, speak out against um, or speak up, speak up for, um, because there are going to be students in your classroom who probably look up to you. And um, if you're not speaking up against those uh, about those things, they're probably going to think that you don't really care about them. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that those are some of the ways that um, that can be addressed and incorporated into the classroom. Would any other panelists like to address that? Thank you, uh, Miriam. You did a wonderful job. I want to chime in uh, uh, for teachers of uh, younger students that we have to be really careful the way we bring topics into the classroom in order not to re-traumatize our students that are from the global majority. So if we're, um, we need to actually see what the waters look like in our student population in order not to bring a topic that is gonna re-traumatize. Uh, younger students have a different way to process trauma and it shouldn't be brought up uh, without any context and without having a constant, um, uh, you know, uh, preparation on what it is uh, to be anti-bias as a person. It's specifically when, the, for example, the theme of Black Lives Matter was brought to my classroom, it was brought up by one of my students that wanted to discuss because that student made a connection with something that we were learning, that it was, um, that it was, uh, it had to do with racism in one of the Spanish speaking countries. So it, it was brought up very naturally but uh, you have to be a good facilitator of the conversation in your class in order not to re-traumatize your students of the global majority. That's very important to take into account. Yeah, um, thank you for that. I, I do agree, but I also think that we need to have balance because the reality is as a parent of a, a black boy, because we live in a racist society, my son doesn't have the privilege of not being traumatized by these events. 
I understand what you are saying, but we also, again, it's about balance. We also have to keep in mind that these kids, whom those of us who are mm-hmm. parents of color, of these kids, we cannot protect them from these realities. And unfortunately, they lose the privilege of being children because we have to protect them. So I just want to throw that out there. No, I totally agree. And I I speak about, um, I mean, I do a bar in my class all the time. What I said is that teachers should be careful the way they bring that topic in order not to re-traumatize this, the students of the global majority and black students specifically, you know, because sometimes teachers and I've seen it uh, and that's what I'm mentioning in elementary schools, they bring out the topic in a way that is not, um, that is not child friendly, that is not age appropriate. And I'm, and I'm thinking about my kindergartners. I'm thinking about, it's not that you don't discuss the topic It's usually uh, sometimes what I've seen is the educator highlight the kid that is going through that trauma and it shouldn't be, these topics shouldn't be discussed like that, discussed like that. Um, not that not to bring the topic, of course, bring the topic to the classroom, but don't center, don't center the student in that conversation. You know, like, ah, can you tell me about your experience with racism or something like that? That's what I'm thinking uh, for what I've seen out there. I wanted to just add uh, to these great points that my colleagues have stated already. I think it's in 30 seconds or less. I think it's important to um, state your why. Um, So instead of just kind of dropping it, um, be thoughtful about why are you doing that? Um, and state that, like bring that into the discourse. You know, I'm having this conversation because um, that can be helpful. And then when st- uh, our students take these conversations back home, they have a context for, for what has just taken place in the classroom. Um, I really admonish educators not to use the strategy of waiting until you have all of the details, all the information, you're the perfect facilitator before um, you engage. And so in so doing, it's okay to say, I'm still working through this. Um, I'm actually, you know, I may not have this all completely drawn out. I'm still working through this, but I think it's important that we address this. And so if you present it in a space of grace, um, oftentimes you'll receive grace. Um, also, ask your students what they, ask your students, you know, is uh, what, how do you want us? Have a conversation at the beginning. We know that these things are going to come up. Um, how do you want us to address these in class and hear from different perspectives, different voices? Um, it doesn't mean that you necessarily go with one or the other, but you're at least inviting those conversations into the classroom. Um, now, stop there. Thank you. Well, that's great. Everyone, every single panelist had a chance to respond to that question. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next one. How do you address opposition that you may face to having an anti racist classroom? Opposition could be from students, faculty, parents, school administration, legislators, and so forth. Uh, Cecile, would you mind starting us off with that one? Sure, thank you. Uh, I mean, I think you address opposition by trying to find allies, or I don't like the term allies, I prefer co-conspirators or um, accomplice, and also, remembering why you are doing this work, what drives you, it's back to what Krishana was saying, finding your why. And I find that people get defensive because of fear. So in my class, when I'm teaching about bell hooks, when I'm teaching about Patricia Hill Collins, when I'm teaching about American occupation of Haiti and other spaces, French colonization. I remind students that this is complex. It's not just binary. I am a strong believer of intersectionality. So I try to present these issues from that lens. And also when I've taught language classes, I have actually put students in groups where they have to do pros and cons. For instance, I remember once um, teaching a class, it was, I don't know, mid 2000, where 
issues of immigration was there were really lots of conversation and I put students in group where they had to come up with argument for immigration and argument against immigration and they had to come back and prepare their um their reasoning and I will put students I know who were for from what they have seen students who were against and I will make them think about the other's perspective so that I can make it complex for them. Because as educators, no matter what grade we are teaching, one of our main goal is to teach students to think critically. And we have to do that with care, compassion, and, and context. Did you have anything, Miriam, before I jump in? Okay. Um, so I would say, in addition to what has been shared, I think it's really important that we're strategic about opposition. Um, and I want to be really sensitive to that because people have lost jobs based on based on you know opposition. Um, livelihoods can be radically shifted based on opposition, and so I really want to be sensitive to that. And some of the kind of tools that I would say is. Um, attach what you're doing in your classroom to things that are beyond just yourself, not just because it's, you're making a moral case for it, which is, which is really good. But for example, um, in Massachusetts, they have a social justice framework right now. And so know what's happening in your state to be able to say, this is actually in alignment with the goals of our state. Um, uh, framework, or the fact that the president of ACFL, Victoria Russell, um, is facilitating these webinars that are based on critical conversations. Be able to say, if there's opposition, our national world language professional development organization is doing this work. I'm following suit with that. And so again, be very aware of what's happening in your state, what's happening in a national framework, a national context, so that when you are addressing these matters in your classroom, it's not just random. Uh, it really is based on what's happening in our field. So I work, um, I have worked in a private uh, sector for a long time where uh, in progressive schools, but where the population is primary white. So you must imagine the sort of fragility that I have encountered in those environments. And even in the so-called liberal or progressive uh, places. So what I have done in the past is, um, as Cecile said, I, I don't like the word ally either. I find accomplices and I usually do like cross-curricular projects. I find uh, I find solace and, <laughs> and a place to talk and, and also process with my diversity equity directors at school. You sh I've been lucky uh, that I have had great uh, diversity and equity director. I have also made myself um, a tool of information for parents and I share a lot of newsletters. I share a lot of the work that I do with links to what anti-bias or anti-racist education is or what it looks like on a on a classroom, and even though you educate people, there's still going to be there's still going to be fragility, there's still going to be opposition, and I think that's something that we um, we learn to live with that. That not everybody is going to like what we're doing if we're going swimming against the currents. So, and uh, as Krishna said, like there are people that have lost jobs and there's, there are teachers switching schools for the same reason, because we like to see the diversity mission statement of the school come to life in our curriculum. And if we're not allowed to do that, then it's just performance, you know? So um, that, that is what I've done. Like I have found co find community in the people that I see that are actually committed before um, beyond optics, and I have tried to educate parents too. Uh, and you know, there's so much that we can do. The, it, it will never be a perfect environment to do this work. So there are some things that we learn to live with, you know, and discomfort is one of those. Miriam, do you have anything to add to this or shall we go to the next question? It's up to you. Um, no, I think everything <laughs> was pretty much said. I definitely echo um, the discomfort definitely comes first. 
Um, so, yeah. Great, let's go on to the last question. Following this question, Adrian is going to be moderating all the questions that went into the chat. So this last question for our panelists is what policy shifts need to take place so that there is transformational, sustainable, enduring change? And I'll ask Francoise to start us off. Okay, so this is like a state to state, uh, case to case um, answer, right? So I, I feel that my friends that have worked in college and have more knowledge than, than I do in respect to policies. And, and, uh, but I feel like each school community, like it was mentioned before, should have such clear uh, statements on their websites and in, in their welcoming to the new parents to the community uh, about the work that is being done in that community. I think just, um, just educating the community in general and also being clear that this is what we're doing anti-racism, we're an anti-racist school and we stand for these beliefs. So anyone that's gonna join the community knows the work that is being done. I mean, it sounds very idealistic and it is, you know, because there's always, like I said, people that are gonna be oppositional, especially the more direct you are, the more intentional you are uh, in your curriculum, the more opposition you're gonna get. But I think, I think a clear statement from a district, a clear statement for, for a school community, a clear statement for a state, um, and, and also using, like Krishana said, like uh, uh, ACFL as, as a, as a um, as a um, backup to, to you know, um, justify what you're doing, you know, to use it as for those people that are like, oh, this must be Francois thing, you know, it's not something that's happened national level. You can, you know, quote actual statements and uh, actual, you know, uh, um, different, um, different communications that have been uh, around. But I think it's something very tricky and it's um, the way it looks like it will look different in each community, you know? Yeah, and I think for me to um, add one more thing is at times we hide behind policy when it's convenient for us. Because even, and I can, my experience is in um, higher ed, but I work with colleagues um, in K-12, and I think about the fact that oftentimes it's when it becomes convenient, because even with everything going on in Georgia, the attack on um, critical race theory, whether it's perceived, and because people have used that term, I'm using it with quote. I think at times it depends on the school. It depends on the culture of the school. It depends on um, what cloud uh, particular schools and particular individuals have. And what's interesting is what people do not realize, if we don't have the foundation in our K-12, when these students come to college, we claim we want them to be quote unquote global citizen. I think I would like for policies to look at what does it mean to be global citizen? What does global mean? Does it mean only white, um, heterosexual, patriarchal classes? So I think in thinking about policies, we need to refine those terms. What does diversity mean? What does equity mean? And we have to get those language into, into policy. I would say, um, I don't want to repeat anything that's already been said. It is essential that we have the 600 people who are on this webinar. And my thought is that you're probably here because you have a sensitivity to the topic at hand, anti-racism in languages, 
responding to the current climate. You're here because you have a sensitivity to that topic. We need for that shift to happen and that sensitivity to go beyond the classroom and beyond the webinar into spaces where policy is made. And those spaces, sadly, are typically not the classroom. They're not the webinar. The spaces where policy is actually made is, is quite frankly, on boards. And so we need as many people serving on boards as possible who have this sensitivity and proclivity towards anti-bias, anti-racism, LGBTQ, all the intersections that are interwoven in what we're discussing. And so we, I'm doing a, a lot of um, conversations with very thoughtful people who I wanna see on boards. And so I would admonish the 600 of you to think, you know, where you are located in your local areas, is there a state organization, a national organization, a regional organization? We really do need you penetrating boards where, those, where that policy work is happening. Great. Um, Miriam, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, um, I was thinking a lot about um, critical race theory and how like, that's just always been like some type of, of debate. Um, and just like seeing like the importance of like keeping it and not um, not banning critical race theory or really any type of theory that um, talks about uh, intersectionality and things like that. Um, and uh, really echoing with, with um, what Krishana said about making sure that you're on the board, making sure that you're listening to people um, who, who, you know, have these concerns um, and I think, uh, you know, really looking at the people who are sitting at the table and looking at people who aren't at the table and need to be at the table. I think that that is also really important. Um, so, yeah. Very well said. Adrian's going to come on now with the questions from the chat. And then the last four minutes, Joe's going to explain how you can stay engaged with the topic after this webinar ends and even create products and resources for teachers. So, Adrian. Yes. Um, we just had a few. If you have more, feel free to put them in the chat, but we might not have time. But let's start with um, Francoise. There was a question. Um, you mentioned um, strategies to improve a student's lens. Do you have some more strategies that you could share or if anyone else has some strategies to share to continue? So I think the person was talking about the students attending college to become teachers. Wasn't that the case? She, um, you're right. She mentioned that um, she works with um, college students. So there, she mentioned that their, their views can become fossilized after so many years of the same thing. So if you have other ideas on how we could work to um, improve their lens. So I think uh, personally, what worked for me into my own personal decolonization, into washing off all the white, all the white supremacy that I was fed of in the school. Uh, at first, as, as an instructor, if you want to work on that, I think it's um, realizing that if you grew up in the United States, you have been brainwashing to believe in all those epistemologies that support white supremacy. So first of that, and what had worked for me personally, it's being in contact and reading about the real history of the place where I'm from and the history from the United States from the mouth of first indigenous people in the, the book, Indigenous History of the United States. It's very well documented and it's an excellent resource in order to understand how the systems of oppressions were set in place in those times. Um, there, uh, there, I would say, read Paulo Freire. <laughs> you know I'm a Freire fan. Uh, to have students um, think critically about anything, anything that crosses your path, any news, any, um, anything that, you, that we're being fed of by society, we need to see with critical eyes. Um, I mean, for me personally, what work was uh, reading and um, I felt really betrayed about my education and all the things that I was made to believe because I was fed with that. Um, I think students right now have an advantage 
uh, in comparison to all, all generations <laughs> that they have, um, you know, the web to at their feet, you know, so they can, if they doubt something, they can Google. So I think uh, um, learn, like as a learner, making sure that our students, um, younger or older are critical, uh, can just start that little flame that will ask them to question anything that comes uh, their path, you know. Do we have about three minutes? Do any of the other panelists want to chime in on that one, or would you like another question? He can pose another question so we can get a few more voices in. Yeah, the next question is for those of you who teach secondary, so Krishan and Cecile. Um, how do you deal, I know we had the question on pushback, but specifically when you have college student pushback, um, and if you teach at a primarily white university, how do you navigate that um, pushback? <laughs> It depends on the day. <laughs> um, for me, I'm, I'm very direct. And I think I try to set the tone from day one. You know, before COVID, I ensure I used to have students be in a circle. And what I do is when I have a certain reading, I will actually ask students to come up with questions. They didn't have to bring in answers. So I try to center students so that students are learning from one another. I'm a big bell hooks and Paulo Freire fan, seeing that the community is a classroom and we all have to engage and we are all learning from one another. So, and I talk about my positionality, like I'm very open. I remember teaching my first class on post-colonial film at Portland State University. And this was in the early 2000s when it was, oh, we all the human race kumbaya. And I told students very bluntly at some point, not in a mean way, but look, we're gonna talk about colonization. I'm a black woman. Um, colonization, slavery was not black and white. Let's name it. It's back to what, um, uh, Kushana was saying. And after that, we had one of the most powerful class I've ever had in my career. Uh, and, and of course, there were pushback, but also I think all the students appreciate me giving them the space. We can agree to disagree. And I have rules of engagement. It's about respect. And I think this, this can also be cultural. Sometimes we are in a culture where we don't know how to disagree. And this is one of the things, those of you who may be um, teach French and Francophone cultures, we can be having very heated debate and people go out for a drink after. So there's something about not knowing the difference between the, the topic and the individual. And I find in many spaces, people don't know how to differentiate the two and they take it personally. And that can also be a way not to have real conversation. I know that we are right at time and we need to get to our closing. Um, I would just say, uh, just offer some tools. There are four ways when there are opposition that you can um, uh, facilitate that. Uh, one way is that you can be neutral and sometimes that is actually helpful. Um, it is not sustainable though, because at some point you do need to have a position as, a, as an instructor. So you can be neutral. Um, number two, you can be an advocate, which, is me which means that you have a very strong position and you state that position and it's stated so strongly perhaps or with so much um, um, conviction that people feel they cannot oppose that. And that oftentimes will shut down the opposition, but again, it may not be sustainable. Um, another form of facilitation is the partial facilitator. And this is where you present kind of uh, both sides uh, of an issue that may be helpful for some people who needs to hear that there is another way of thinking about this, another lens. And then the final way is the multi-partial facilitator. This is where you have a clear position. And so if there's opposition, you may state 
this is um, the way that I'm seeing this. You may have a clear position, but you are open to inviting different perspectives into that space. And so those four different ways of facilitating that opposition can be quite helpful, uh, pulling one versus the other, depending upon the situation. Thank you so much. We have so many great questions and topics to explore. Joe's gonna tell us now how we can keep this discussion going. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, again, I'm Joe Valina. I'm the Director of Marketing and Membership for Actful. Um, I wanted to just let everyone know that the, the webinar is in, con in concert with uh, a space on our community, which you've already been admitted to as uh, through your registration here at this webinar. Um, we want to continue the conversation in the community, and you'll, you'll be able to find the recording of this webinar. It takes about a week for us to get everything edited and subtitled and everything, but um, in about a week, you'll see the, the, the recording of this webinar. We'll have guiding questions um, from the panelists that you can then uh, start topics on and discuss within the group. Uh, and, a, and this is a closed discussion board for, so you can collaborate with other educators, share your stories and your ways to deal with certain problems um, in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis. Uh, normally, Celia Chamon Zamora, who is my colleague here at ACTFL, uh, is here to uh, present this part of it. So if, if you have questions about the community and the interaction there, I encourage you to go uh, and email Celia. Uh, she's, she's very well versed in all of it and um, would be very happy to help you um, in, in the conversations that you're having. The way to go, go there is to go to ACTFL Central. Um, you'll all have access to this link, um, and I think uh, Howie will be putting this in the chat as well, but you go to my.actful.org slash critical convos. There you can use your ACTFL account to log in. If you don't have an account yet, it's not a problem. Just go ahead and create one. Um, and you'll also be able to access the community from the drop down under the communities tab on ACTFL's website. And you can see that there in the image that I'm sharing. Finally, um, as part of this whole series, the Critical Conversation series, ACTFL will be developing um, some products and services around the ideas that are put together so your ideas can come forward and bubble up and actually be used uh, in the greater world language community. Uh, we'll be setting up a monthly check-in meeting to provide guidance and answer questions, uh, but what we're not gonna be involved in the logistics involving the conversations, follow-ups, and, and that that's really user-generated and left up to you to kind of uh, percolate on your own and make sure that those ideas keep flowing. Uh, the products should be finished in about three months. And once they're completed, send them to plc at actful.org. Um, again, that's Celia's group at Actful. And they're the ones that will look at the ideas, see what we can develop and, and move forward with those. Um, and then we'll work to publish your work on the website and disperse the appropriate stakeholders. And one other thing that I, that I can't, uh, that I'd be remiss in, in mentioning as the director of membership is we would love to have all of you as members of ACTFL as well. So if you're not currently a member, you can get a membership for only $45 a year. Um, it's the best investment you can make in yourself and your career. And, and we would love to have you as members. So please go to the site and join us uh, if you can. Some of the products uh, ideas, uh, now these are for a, a different uh, pillar but the ideas of the types of things that can come out of this are letters or templates outlining alternatives, recruitment teacher uh, materials for teachers, or FAQs that can help other teachers along their journey uh, for the types of topics that we've been discussing today in the critical conversation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Victoria. Thank you all very much. Yes, and I want to encourage everyone also to attend the actual annual convention and language expo. November 18th through 20th in Boston. It's going to be hybrid, so I hope to see you either in person or online. Thanks so much, everyone, for attending this evening.